Hello and welcome to The Door to Law. My name is Donya and today I'm joined by Fiona Robertson, who is a Senior Counsel and Head of Media at Alta Mimi. Fiona has over 25 years experience in the media and entertainment space and has been ranked as a tier one lawyer in media law by both Chambers and Partners and Legal 500. Before moving to the UAE, Fiona also worked in Australia for one of the country's largest national broadcasters. Fiona, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for coming. Absolute pleasure to be here. <laughs> so you're a media and entertainment lawyer. Um, I'm a corporate lawyer, so please tell, <laughs> tell So for me, media and entertainment sounds very glamorous, um, but I'm sure it's not like all red carpet events. So can you please tell us like, what does your kind of day-to-day -day role encompass? Sadly, no red carpet events. <laughs> we, we generally uh, don't get invited to those. Uh, essentially, as a media lawyer, I'm a commercial lawyer in the same way that you are. Um, we are structuring deals. We are looking after uh, contracts for, for, for distribution. It's just everything is focused on the media industry. So in the same way that you would try and finance um, a project, I'm financing a project. It just happens to be a film. Mm -hmm. So uh, I work in film and television. I do a lot of work with the platforms. So if you look at all those little icons on your phone, most of those will be clients of mine. Uh, I do a lot of work in the music space. I, I work with advertising an awful lot. So with advertising, we're doing things like like we might be commissioning an agency to come in and work for a brand, or we might be clearing the content to make sure that it's compliant with the regulations in uh, one of the countries in the, in the region. So it's quite a broad, 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 yes, broad strokes, a big job. Um, but you really need to have a great knowledge of the industry itself. And that's as an industry focused lawyer, that's always going to be the case. But it sounds like you've worked on some really interesting projects. And I know when you were in Australia, you worked on Neighbours, yes, Home and Away, which I grew up watching as a child. And um, also, you know, recently I know that you worked on the Dubai Tourism Campaign, yes, I, I think, which featured Gwyneth Paltrow, Kate Hudson and, and Zoe Saldana. Mm -hmm. So uh, just curious, what's been your like most standout kind of career mm -hmm. moment to date? I must admit, I, I love working on feature films. I've, uh, I enjoy the challenge of that. They're very large projects and there's an awful lot of moving parts. So for us as lawyers, they're kind of more interesting. I worked on the first Emirati feature film, which was City of Life. Uh, we did all of the, the legals for that. And that was a very big job. It was the first time that they'd made a big feature film in, in the region, in, in, in this country. So uh, it was quite a complex uh, one to pull off. And that was really enjoyable, really challenging. Uh, the crew that were making the film were just lovely. So I was dealing with people that were a pleasure to deal with as well. Going back even earlier than that, I was actually the lawyer on a show called Australia's Most Wanted, which Ooh. was a true crime show. Ooh, but for me, the, the, the interesting part of it was I used to sit in the studio when they were going out live and I'd be like, yes, you can say that. No, you can't say that. Yes, you can say that. No, you can't say that. So quite a lot of power. And that was uh, that was quite fun, but also uh, really challenging um, and, a, and, a, and a great work environment as well, working yeah. with journalists. So uh, obviously we mentioned you worked in Australia. Now compared to Australia's media industry, the UAE media industry is yeah. relatively young. Um, so kind of what made you decide, first of all, to, to come out here mm -hmm. and in your view, what do you think is probably most needed to develop the UAE's media industry? Interesting question. I came here because I'd, I'd done an awful lot in the Australian media industry and as you say it's a very it's a very uh, mature market so I kind of looked around and thought I've sort of done all the things here that I think are interesting. I'd like to go somewhere where there's something new and something challenging for me as, as a professional and of course uh, Media City had just started and uh, this was just before 2454 was launched so it was right back in the very very early days of media in the Emirates uh, so that to me was was challenging it, I knew that there was going to be uh, a lot of things that I could add value as, as someone who had a lot of experience in a mature market. I think that I think the Emirates has done really well. I mean, I've only been here for 12 years and the growth I've seen in 12 years has been incredible. I think there's still a lot of a lot of uh, room for, for more financing options for people who are in the content industry, a little bit more support for people who are trying to grow content, uh, content, content companies, because for SMEs here, you know, it's hard to find finance. For an SME that's in content production, it's even harder because it's very hard to find an ROI for that sometimes. So, you know, that it would be really nice to see more options there. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting in this region is that we have uh, people from numerous languages uh, and, and, and different cultures all in the same place. And for a content creator, that gives us more audiences that we can look at and focus on. And I think that, that 
finding more distribution outlets for people of different languages and cultures is something that we're already doing really well and I think we could really grow on that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that because I think one of the things that first struck me when I came to the UAE, when I turned on the TV, a lot of the channels do tend to be um, focused at Arabic speakers yes, and I actually do speak Arabic so for me it's it's fine but sometimes I do think okay but what about all of the other expats who might be wanting some more I don't know English absolutely and I see a lot of things that are you know look like amazing Arabic content but I I don't understand it I don't have the language skills to, to get there I am seeing now there's there's Arabic content that's being subtitled in English and I think that's a great way forward and it mm. also it's a really good communication tool for us to see as expats the country that we've chosen to live in you know you get a bond with a country when you see it on a screen and I learned that weirdly from Neighbours which was you yeah. know for such a, a small show and it was very you know neighbourhood it is exactly what it says on the tin but Australians saw themselves on television and that is is I think a really important thing for a culture to have. You're absolutely right on that point it does give you an insight into the country's absolutely. culture so um, just interested you know in the Middle East what are the kind of common media entertainment issues that you come across what is it that clients often want to know? Uh, I mean most of my work is transactional so I generally tend to work on contracts but the more interesting stuff is the regulatory stuff. So it's, you know, what can I say, what can't I say? And we get a lot of that work in both content and in advertising. Uh, so we, uh, we are looking at the, the Media Council rules and the publications laws and seeing, you know, what it says, what, what can you say, what can't you say? Um, and that to me is more interesting because it's very nuanced and it's also very reliant on what the government's views are of particular content. So you're not just looking at the bold-faced words, you're looking at the intention behind the words, what, what, what audience are they trying to address with this? Who is concerned about this the most? And how can I work within the guidelines to get the content that I want? And I find that sort of work really interesting. Mm -hmm. So we, you mentioned earlier that, you know, it would be helpful if there are more content outlets mm -hmm. potentially. Now with technology, mm -hmm. um, you know, having an impact, um, we also have social media, mm -hmm. streaming services such mm -hmm. as Netflix, all of that. I mean, what kind of impact do you think that is having on the kind of legal industry right now? And, and how is your role as a media and entertainment lawyer also had to evolve? Well, the change, the big change for us is that most of our clients are now uh, not necessarily sitting in the Emirates. They're sitting either across the region generally or they're overseas completely. So they might be sitting in the US or in Europe and they're looking at this market and trying to work out how they can infiltrate and and bluntly get revenue uh, from the consumers that are sitting in this market. So what we're trying to do then is we're, we're trying to get uh, an understanding of what the cultural norms are here to somebody in Los Angeles or New York or in Frankfurt who has zero concept of what, what this region actually stands for. So what we're now doing is we're almost like cultural attaches, you know, sort of talking to people about what this, what does this really mean in, in, in real terms mm -hmm. and what does an Arabic audience want to see? Because in a sense, a lot of the laws are reflective of what society wants not they're not dictating they're actually reflective and so we, we have to get that through to to, uh, to people who are trying to make content for people in this region and we can't end this without talking about COVID-19 <laughs> um, what does the future hold for the media and entertainment industry you know post uh, COVID uh, it's going to be very quite quite complex I think and quite layered um, I mean the first thing we've got obviously is the production shutdown which has happened here as well as globally uh, so when you're seeing uh, you know for example production industries in Los Angeles have been quiet for three months now that means we've got three months of US content that's not going to be available it hasn't been made yet so that's going to have a flow-on effect in what you're going to see in your Netflix because suddenly there won't be as much new content coming through we're going to have a little gap We've got theatrical windows, there's problems with those because things are not going into theatres, obvious reasons, they're not open. But that has a flow on effect to free to air broadcasters because they will have to wait a little bit longer to get a film. So we've got this flow on effect of what the, you know, this shutdown of not being able to produce is gonna flow on to other industries and other parts of the industry later on. So we're going to be dealing with that, I'm gonna guess for the next 12 to 18 months, wow. there's going to be issues and, and you know, that's, We'll deal with it, we always do. But once it settles, do you think there's going to kind of be almost like an influx of kind of new projects and people kind of getting excited? I think the interesting thing about the COVID shutdown globally was the way that people immediately went to content as their first choice of things to do, outside of obviously learning how to bake bread. We all got that done <laughs> in the first month. 
<laughs> but what we went to was our content and what people were doing then was they were sharing recommendations for shows on Netflix or for obscure Spanish dramas, the you know, money yeah, I heist, watched, I watched so many of which, those. you know, became suddenly the next big thing and, that, and then people were recommending other Spanish dramas. So, you know, suddenly seeing people take an interest in multilingual productions, mm -hmm. that's fabulous for global production and hopefully that will sustain and we'll, and we'll see a growth in, in people's interest in, in less mainstream uh, content, which will mean more producers will be able to get work uh, put onto Netflix and they'll be able to monetize. So I'm hoping it will be really good for media. Yeah. I think the other thing that's quite interesting from an advertising perspective, because a lot of this comes down to what advertisers will pay for in the long run, uh, they haven't spent much money this year. So it'll be interesting to see what happens next year as far as budgets go and whether they'll be putting a little bit more money into things to get their brand front and centre with consumers again, having seen a drop off in 2020. Fiona, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you for being interested. <laughs> You're welcome. And thank you everyone for watching.